It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm Tom Cullison. I'm from the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda. And during this session, we're going to uh, explore further some issues that have been brought up earlier about what's the military's role in all of this, and uh, how does the United States military engage in uh, the Asia-Pacific region, specifically in the, in the lower Mekong region, and explore some of those issues, perhaps get a word about the uh, U.S. military support of the USAID Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance efforts in, in the Philippines that are currently going on. And to address this, it's our pleasure today to have Rear Admiral Colin Chin, who's the U.S. Pacific Command Surgeon. Uh, Dr. Chin has worked in the Asia-Pacific area for about the past 15 years in one guise or another. He was stationed in Okinawa as a gastroenterologist at our hospital there. Uh, he has been the Marine Forces Pacific uh, Surgeon, in which capacity he's worked with disaster response and health issues in support of the Marine Corps throughout the Pacific area including many uh, health engagement operations. He was uh, the officer in charge of the U.S. military TRICARE office in the Pacific region, which looks at the military's health care delivery plan in that area, and currently is back in the Pacific at the U.S. Pacific Command as a surgeon. So we welcome Rear Admiral Colin Chin. Uh, Dr. Collison, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And Dr. Morrison, thank you very much for inviting me to be here with this august panel. Uh, I appreciate you bringing me back from Hawaii to here to, uh, to the DC area, but it truly is a privilege for me to represent US Pacific Command at this, this very important and, and vital symposium. Uh, since I have the pleasure and the honor of uh, presenting, doing my presentation one hour after we all had, had lunch, um, and for those who uh, are jet lagged, uh, I decided to do a little bit, things a little bit different. You're going to have a very short, I trust you, very short presentation of what PACOM is all about and what I and my staff do in the surgeon's office. So here is the, uh, the area of responsibility for U.S. Pacific Command. It encompasses half of the Earth's surface. It encompasses a wide area, as you can see, encompassing over 50% of the, of the world's population. Uh, three of the largest nations in terms of population reside in our AOR. And three of the largest economies are in the Asia Pacific region. However, also seven of the poorest countries in terms of economy are in this area. So it's a very large and diverse region, and we like to say it stretches from Bollywood in India to Hollywood in Southern California. So with that, there are several threats to health in the region that, that, we, that we deal with, starting with natural disasters, as evidenced in the, in the Philippines uh, last week. Every year, there is some form of natural disaster that will occur in the Pacific, whether it is a typhoon, an earthquake, a tsunami, or a volcano that's erupting. It occurs in the, in the Pacific region. And if a disaster is declared by the country and the U.S. ambassador in the region in the, in the country also declares a disaster, USID takes the lead for the US government, and, and DOD is a supporting element for the, for the US effort. So we have natural, natural disasters, but we also have very high population densities, the emergence of mega cities, and as, as well as a water quality in some areas that, that may not be the best. So you combine these factors, as well as the deforestation that you heard earlier, which then human populations going into the forest are then exposed to emerging or novel viruses and other diseases, sets up a, a situation in which disease transmission is very easy and creates problems for, for the population there. In addition, as these countries are increasing their economic abilities, their standard of, of living increases, and with that, the aspirations to follow Western lifestyles 
and, and Western diets. And of course, with that comes what we've been experiencing here in the United States and in the Western societies, the, 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 the a plague of non-communicable diseases. So the obesity epidemic that we have here in the United States, the problems with hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, and what we're seeing is these countries are now beginning to see these problems. So what do we do in, 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 in the US uh, PACOM command surgeon's office? These are my priorities. I think it's very important for peace and stability in the region that engagements between the Chinese and US militaries are peaceful. And, and, and productive, and health is a very easy way for that type of relationship to develop and to build, and, with, and that is what we are doing today as I speak. Engagements with China is my number one priority, but closely following that, as we heard here, I, I thank Dr. Ort for your question about um, uh, malaria elimination and, and what is the military role? Well, we have a very, we are heavily engaged in this, and I would like to discuss that further when I, when I talk with Dr. Cullison. So we'll, there's more to follow on that. Um, as we saw last week, health response to disaster is a major effort that in, at the PACOM Surgeon's Office that we participate in. Um, do we have a role uh, at, in, in the Philippines right now? The fact that I am standing here before you means that no, right now, uh, as, as we get uh, the information from USID folks on the ground, that from a, from a health perspective, DOD is not required at this time to respond. Now, DOD is providing significant logistic support to the Republic of the Philippines. They've asked for, for heavy and medium lift to transport supplies, equipment, food, we are asked for search and rescue teams. We have asked to, to provide imaging, to provide our, our, uh, our aircraft and our high altitude aircraft to survey the area of devastation to give the planners a better idea of exactly what the, the, the level of, of destruction is required and what, what planning efforts to, uh, need to occur in the future. But as it stands right now, there is uh, no requirement for DOD to provide any medical response teams. And then I, I'll, finally I'll say that uh, emerging infectious diseases is another large area uh, of interest for us. Obviously about five years ago when uh, avian flu was, was a very hot topic, uh, we were very much engaged with that. Dr. Collison was engaged in some, in some of those efforts. And we use our military labs, AFRINS in Thailand, and the Naval Medical Research Center Asia, which is now headquartered in Singapore, to work with regional labs, labs such as the Institute Pasteur in Cambodia, Institute Pasteur in Laos, to work together on, on disease surveillance, vector control, and vaccine research. And we're also working with, uh, again, the, the countries in the Mekong, as well as the entire AOR, to help them achieve the World Health Organization International Health Regulation Standards. So we are, again, working very closely with those organizations to achieve those goals. So how do we do that? Well, we partner. Now, in the past, I would say that DOD has probably been criticized, and probably rightfully so, that we, that we worked in a vacuum. We just sort of did what we did and, and didn't uh, consult or collaborate or communicate with anyone else. Even among our four services, we were guilty of that. We would have a Marine unit go to a country and do an, a health engagement. A month later, there would be an Air Force team that would go to the exact same location, do the exact same thing. And the question would be then asked, did we accomplish anything? And the answer is no. Because the goal back then was to do some things we called medcaps. You come in with a team, you bring in dentists, pull a bunch of diseased teeth, bring an optometrist, maybe provide some new glasses, deworm the kids, and then we leave. Did we build capacity for that, that local health, health system? Did we, did we build cap capability for, for uh, that country by doing that? And the answer is no, because a week later, the kids are, are bathing 
or are playing or drinking the polluted water. They're reinfected with the worms. By pulling all the teeth, we, have, may, we may have just put out, the, out of business the local dentist and providing eyeglasses put out of business the optometrist. So we're changing our approach now as, as we engage uh, with, with our partner nations in terms of trying to work with them to build their capacity and capability. No longer are we, are we, are we doing med caps and den caps. We're doing subject matter expert exchanges. We're doing academic exchanges. Again, trying to build capability and capacity. And we're also trying not to do this in a vacuum. We try to do this with our US government interagency partners, some of which I have, I have listed there. This is not an all-encompassing uh, uh, slide. If you don't see your logo, that doesn't mean that we don't work with you. Um, we try to work, again, a whole-of-government approach. So it's not just DOD going in by themselves. We go in working. As we, as we, if you go to the embassy, I, you know, I, I met with many of the ambassadors, met with many of the country teams, and say, how can we work with you and your team to better coordinate DOD's effort for your effort, Mr. or Mrs. Ambassador, for your goals for, for, the, for this country. So that is our, our new approach. Uh, likewise, again, we work with several NGO organizations. We work with private organizations, private universities, again, with a whole of government approach. And likewise, in the country, trying to use a whole of government approach as well. So I'll take malaria, for example. In, in many countries, and it was, it was alluded to in, in the, in the uh, malaria panel, that the Ministry of Health may have a national program for el malaria elimination. And several times, the military, that nation's military, may not be invited. So what I'm trying to do is work with that military, work with the ambassador, to get the Ministry, Minister of Health, the Minister of Defense together so that we can include the military as part of a national effort, again, for a whole of government approach, not just whole of, whole of US government approach, but whole of government approach for our partner nation. So Pacific Partnership is a prime example of one of our many engagements that we do in the AOR. This stemmed from the 2004-2005 tsunami, as you may or may not recall, the, the huge tsunami that um, affected a huge part of the region, Indonesia, Thailand, all the way into the, to the, I think, to the Maldives. And um, we responded initially with the USS Abraham Lincoln and the USNS Mercy. That opened a lot of eyes, that, that event, because Polls were taken in Indonesia before in which the, the favorable rating for the United States was 20%. After our response to the tsunami, it was over 60%. Admiral Mullen, when he was the chief of naval operations, wanted to kill the hospital ship program that the Navy had. When he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said he's glad that he did not kill that program. So since then, we have an annual program it's called Pacific Partnership. Every year, we either send the Mercy or we send a large uh, uh, amphib to go to over several months to several of the countries in the region, and we rotate that. It's not always the same country. Working on disaster response preparedness, not just for us, but for our partner nations. And I think with the, even though it, it's been a devastating event for the Philippines from the, from the typhoon. And again, time will tell, but I think their response has been tremendous because I, I look back to, again, US military medical has not been asked to come. They're taking care of many of these issues on their own. So, so we, we will see. So I just wanted to tee up these, um, these topics for you to give you an idea of what we do in US PACOM. And I, will, I look forward to the discussion with Dr. Collison as well as your questions. And I leave this last slide for my colleagues, members of the audience who come from the uh, warmer regions of the world. As you're, as you're shivering here, I see lots of people with uh, heavy overcoats. Think of the picture here. Hopefully that will warm your hearts. Thank, thank you very much. Colin, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, 
the military has been accused of not following humanitarian principles, you know, humanity, uh, neutrality, uh, impartiality. Is it reasonable to expect the U.S. military or any other military to follow the same principles that NGOs might follow or the ICRC or other totally neutral organizations? Uh, what is the role of the U.S. military <coughs> uh, writ large, and how does health play in that role, particularly in the Pacific? So uh, th thank you for that question. Let me first respond to how does uh, health, what is the role of health in the Pacific? And, and I'll get back to the president's uh, rebalance initiative. I think health plays a huge role, at least in, in, in the U.S. government's response uh, for the rebalance is that we play a huge role in that because we all think about in terms of the rebalance in terms of, in terms of DOD is shifting uh, aircraft, shifting ships, shifting large units, and, and that is happening. However, as Admiral Lochner, the U.S. Pacific commander, has mentioned several times in public and has mentioned to me is that health is, is le in many respects leading the rebalance efforts in U.S. PACOM because, in, and as I said before, and I alluded to before, that health is considered non-controversial. Health is, can, can be considered safe. In several of these countries in which we're having emerging relationships and health can open doors for uh, military to military health engagements that are not open for traditional military to military engagements. So for example, Myanmar. Um, that is a, 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 a country that is emerging with their new democracy, but because of the history of that military, uh, there is the, the human rights abuses from that military in the past. It is, it is, we have to be very careful in DOD in what types of engagements that we can have. Uh, there are some openings in the legal uh, profession that are starting, and there are initial discussions about can health be the next step. And so in August of this, of, of this year, um, we participated in a um, multilateral health engagement in Thailand, hosted and led by the Thais, with us invited, and the uh, and Myanmar medical, um, uh, military medical folks were invited to discuss uh, tropical disease topics <coughs> as well as disaster relief. So that is an area where, I, again, to answer is how, how does health play a role in, in the Pacific? I think that is one very important area. And to answer your, your first question, you know, we need to follow all the standard rules of conduct. We can't just go into a country and do what we want to do. We do have to follow all, all, the, all the standard rules. I mean, Secretary Russell was just here. He just talked about what the State Department does in terms of diplomacy is not altruistic. It's in the United States' best interest. And I think it's safe to assume that people who wear a uniform are there to represent their country. <clears throat> and it is about advancing that country's uh, issues. And in that regard, we've, we've had a lot of talk about malaria. We've had a lot of talk, sort of some allusions to the overseas labs, to NAMRU and the uh, Navy Medical Research Center Asia. Uh, Explain a little bit about what the military's interest in infectious disease was initially in terms of force health protection, how that evolved into permanent overseas labs, and how that's kind of evolved into a national, uh, a national uh, capability that the United States and others can use and the host country can use. But we did something selfish, and it turned out to be something that other people are using now. Right. Obviously, you know, um we will do things that uh, obviously is, is good for the U.S. military, but it does translate into good things uh, for our host and, and partner nations. But going back to, let's go back to the beginning um, of why is uh, the military involved in infectious diseases? It just goes back, just think of some of the, uh, just, again, let's start with malaria, you know, Panama Canal. The efforts to build that canal multiple times in the past were thwarted by malaria, but it was a uh, U.S. Army um, physician who uh, solved that problem, and, and, and we were able to um, build that canal as a nation, which obviously it benefited the United States, but then benefited the world because now we had this this, this canal. 
But one of my, one of my charges as, as a command surgeon is the health of our active duty forces. And so we will go to areas in the world in which there are significant infectious disease threats. And so I have to, we, so it's in our interest to do research in, in, uh, in infectious disease for uh, surveillance, uh, vaccine research, uh, treatment research, uh, prophylaxis, and, and prevention so that, I, so that we can deploy a healthy force who will not get ill while they're deployed. Uh, historically, in the wars that we have had, it's something we call non-battle uh, diseases, I meaning infectious diseases, was the main reason why military members could not fight. It wasn't from wounds or injuries from battle. It was from infectious diseases. So that's really the genesis of why the US military is in, in, in involved in infectious disease research and then coordinates to why do we have overseas laboratories. So we have, uh, the Army has a joint US Army, Royal Thai Army, uh, AFRIM's Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences. It's in, based in um, Bangkok, Thailand. They have been there for over 50 years. A joint Thai US Army uh, lab that's done tremendous work in Thailand. And, and in terms of all sorts of, of infectious diseases, malaria, dengue, tuberculosis, you name it. The reason why is because that's where those infectious diseases are located. If we located that lab here in the United States in which we don't have those um, infections or these infectious diseases on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it'd be very hard to, to provide truly groundbreaking research. You have to go where those diseases are located. And also I'll, I'll make a comment that even though our infectious disease specialists are superiorly trained and they have great knowledge, book knowledge, of all, host, all, the, all the infectious disease out there, in the Mekong, the doctors who treat these infections on a day-to-day -day basis have much to teach us on how to manage those, those diseases. So that's why we have our lab. So we have the lab in, in, in Bangkok. We also have the Navy Medical Research Center Asia, which is now in Singapore. That has a history of, I think, 60 to 70 years. And they have been through, and the former commanding officer, Dr. Daniel, standing, sitting right here right in front of me. But they have been, actually started in the Philippines. They went to Indonesia, and are now, now and they are very briefly headquartered in Honolulu. But we have reestablished them in, um, in Singapore. But they also have a hub in Cambodia, and also they have um, some people working in the AFRIMS lab. And, and uh, there's possibilities that we may be able to expand throughout the region, other satellite laboratories, and we're, and we're uh, looking at that. We, we could talk about a lot of things, but we have a few minutes left, so let's take a few questions from the audience. And we have two Navy guys here, so the Air Force told me they wanted a fair time. So, <laughs> Colonel Chambers. Excuse. Good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Chambers of the Air Force International Health Specialist Program. First, uh, Admiral Chen, thank you for your leadership and guidance on these important topics that affect all of us. Uh, our organization in particular has uh, met one challenge I'd like to ask you about. You, you talked uh, briefly on at the podium in that, as we've noticed, working with a number of um, countries in, in a variety of continents, especially hosting an educational forum for disaster preparedness, where we attempt to bring uh, representatives from both the Ministry of Def Defense and Ministries of Health together, many times it becomes apparent that that's the first time those participants have sat together around the same table. So my, my question for you, sir, is how can the military, and I'm speaking specifically with, with Myanmar, but other countries in mind, sir, as we engage with other countries in, in, uh, in your AOR, uh, how can we help encourage them to facilitate a dialogue to better coordinate and prioritize initiatives between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Health? Thank you. Okay. Other questions? In the back, back there. Either way. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Adam Cameron Scott from University of Sydney. I'm actually over here doing a study on civil military cooperation in health security. So this is very fortuitous. Um, my question really is there's a lot of um, debate on both sides of public health and the military about the right or the 
purpose of military engagement in health issues. Um, talking with some of the people here in DC as well as um, some of the locations, when I ask them what is the value that the military bring, almost unanimously the first thing that comes to mind is seems to be the money and the resources. Um, so I'm just interested in your perspective. Other than, you've already mentioned research. Other than that, what areas do you see as the military bringing value adding, given that trust seems to be such an issue? Okay, let's take one more. Hi, Jill Gay, What Works Association. And the military has been a leader on HIV vaccines, so especially in Asia. Could you talk about what the military is doing vis-a-vis HIV in specifically Myanmar and Laos? Thank you. So we've got, how, do we, how does the US military engage other countries, military to military, and military to military to other parts of the country, and how do we encourage discussions? What does the military bring besides money? Uh, is that right? And how, <coughs> the, the question that we discussed earlier is the military tends to do episodic engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, the development agencies tend to be there long term. The one exception to that is the overseas lab. So how does the in episodic engagement facilitate or compete with the ongoing engagement? And then HIV in Myanmar and, uh, and Laos. So let me, uh, so first of all, for on, on, on Myanmar and, uh, and HIV, again, we, this is a very uh, early relationship that, um, so we haven't done anything specifically with HIV, but right now we've only uh, discussed, uh, you know, tropical diseases and disaster relief. Um, we have to take that, you know, a step at a time. Uh, I have to make sure that I'm not stepping ahead of US government policy in regards to engagement with Myanmar. But obviously that's, that's a, a, a disease of interest, disease of concern. So what I think we would do once we get to a point, we would perhaps follow the model that we have used in Vietnam, in which we have done a lot of success. And then Vietnam has had tremendous success in, in, in working the, uh, the AIDS and HIV issue in Vietnam and, and, and use the you know, PEPFAR program. So I think that would be how we would, um, you know, again, given the right time, how we would engage HIV in, in, in Myanmar when, when the time is right. That, that would be the model that I think I, I would look at. As far as um, our engagements uh, with other militaries, I mean, I may be a little bit biased here, but I think there is a lot of benefit uh, to doing that. Um, we don't go to a country unless they ask us to, to go there. Uh, I don't force a program upon a, 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 a host nation military unless they ask for it. We will, we will provide them uh, visibility of the type, different types of programs that we have, and we'll see what are you interested in. So for example, with China, um, they are having problems obviously now with uh, non-communicable diseases, and they have come to us want to have academic exchanges uh, um, to, to work on that problem. The other thing that, that, that we can help benefit uh, is, is to provide an avenue for them to work you know, with their uh, counterparts uh, in, 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 the civilians, in their civilian sector. Because as I mentioned earlier about the, the malaria issue, um, Many of these, these uh, uh, nations, uh, militaries, are not included in the discussion. And so you know, I, I come to forums like this and hear how much of a problem it is. And as I look at the military population, I see that that is a mobile population. Just like the migrant workers, they are also very mobile. They are going to the border regions where there's drug-resistant malaria. They then go home for leave. So they go from that high endemic area back to their city where they're from, or the village where they're from, maybe in which there is no drug resistant malaria, but they're infected. So maybe they're bringing it. So also they, um, many of these, these militaries are using monotherapy as their program. So we're trying to open their eyes to the fact that that is probably not the best approach and perhaps combination therapy is, is the way to go. And many of them are coming to the realization that they need to do that. And we're, we're encouraging them and helping them and giving them in contact with the right people to, 
develop a program, getting them in contact with their Ministry of Health, make sure that they are interlinked with the national program. Another area of concern, which I think will be beneficial, is many of these countries uh, are engaged with or want to be part of the UN uh, Global Peacekeeping Mission going to Africa. Okay, so they're at the, they're at the border regions. Some of their people may be infected with, with uh, uh, malaria resistant, um, or, uh, drug resistant malaria. They don't have programs right now to test their troops before they send them. We're actively engaged with them, encouraging them. You need, you need to have a, a screening program and a treatment program, and then we're assisting them with that effort. Because I think the worst thing we could do, and I think it's great that they're engaged in the, in the peacekeeping program, but then to send their, their folks over to Africa, and that that be, is, is one of potential vehicles to introduce drug-resistant malaria to the African continent. So, uh, so those are just some examples of how we're trying, how I think it's beneficial that, that, that we are engaged, heavily engaged, uh, and actively engaged in, uh, with, with uh, our host nation militaries. What about the question of working with other organizations? And I'd add to that, are there areas besides infectious disease, such as trauma care, some other military-specific things that, uh, that, we, that the military engages in? Right, so uh, you know, we've, we've had, uh, you know, the U.S. military has had 12 years of, of, of war in the Middle East, and we have uh, learned huge lessons on, on management of, of, of a trauma, and so, uh, and, and, and the results of trauma. So very recently, um, we have gotten uh, inquiries uh, from Singapore, actually, because they have some patients who are, are triple amputees. Um, not a result of IED injuries, but they have some triple amputees, and they wanted to know uh, what, what is our approach to managing long-term uh, these patients. So we're sending a, a uh, rehabilitation team from the, um, from the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center uh, in, a, in a couple weeks to Singapore to, again, as a subject matter expert exchange, to have a symposium on this. And then my, my, my goal is because, you know, Singapore is a, has a very robust uh, healthcare system, but we have other countries in the Mekong in which perhaps as a result of this bilateral exchange, we can then develop a multilateral exchange. Because I heard some questions about uh, the, the, the mine issue in, in, in Laos and Cambodia. So I think that's something where we can help. I know these, these countries are, uh, it's, it's an issue. And, and, and we would like to uh, share our, our experience and knowledge from the last uh, 10 years to, to, to these countries. I think we have time for one more round of questions, if we could. In the back. Um, at first, I'd like to thank you for the slide of the warm horizon there. Um, secondly, let's say you get the green light to do mill mill health collaboration in Myanmar. What are your concerns or what are the sensitivities and consideration of partnering with a state that is party to ongoing conflicts? You talked about democracy and, and past human rights abuses, but it's a, a government that's only in name civilian, um, same actors as you know. And secondly, there are still ongoing conflicts. Um, and secondly, you know, we just met with the president last week who said that you know, he's ordered his military to, to honor the ceasefires, but that if it's not carried out in the field, it's not necessarily because it's not the state's will. So you would be partnering, you may be partnering with the state, but implementing in the field where local officers are not following uh, state command. Okay. Other questions? Well, let me, let me uh, so uh, as I alluded to, uh, this would be a very delicate relationship that, that we would, uh, if we are, you know, if we do engage um, more into it. Uh, an area of concentration that I probably would, would stick to in the beginning is drug-resistant malaria. Uh, that, that is one of the epicenters of this problem, and I think that's the one that I think um, I, would, I would focus on fully understanding the, the problems with the military, 
in, in Myanmar, their, their, their past history. And as I said before, I am not going to get forward of U.S. government's intent. And, 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 and I will, you know, we, we obviously we, we coordinate very closely with OSD policy and all sorts, all these types of issues, even before our multilateral engagement um, hosted by Thailand, we checked, we made sure that we got approval from OSD before we did that. So again, it's, it's, it's a very um, sensitive issue and it's a delicate issue. We fully acknowledge that and, and we will take you know, those precautions before we engage. And, and so that's, uh, again, as I said, we will start with malaria and, and as I said, go very slowly. Well, I'm delighted to see so many U.S. military folks here, including General Schoomaker, the former Surgeon General of the Army. Thank you very much for coming. And Admiral Chin, thank you very much for your comments, and we very much appreciate having you here. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Got the brand new uh, oh, yeah. Coca-Cola. <laughs>